All right, so let me give my little welcome here. So I'm Lisa, I'm manning the technical desk here for this meeting, and welcome to June's talk shop. And there we are. So here's our agenda for the day. Um, we're gonna turn this over to Lynn in a moment just to formally welcome us, although I think most of us have been here long enough to, to be welcomed <laughs> already. And Winifred Bird is going to be doing our interviews today. Thank you, Winnie. We're lucky to have her guiding us. Um, so we've got three people from, three, mostly translator, I think. We're gonna get the details on, on, on everyone today, but we have Brenda Hart and Susan, all from Northern Nagano. We'll do interviews for about 20 minutes each. We'll stop for a comfort break, probably 10 minutes, and then questions and answers. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, it's wonderful to see so many familiar and not familiar faces. Um, and especially thank you to our three speakers, guests tonight. So Brenda Kaneta is a translator and interpreter living in Suzaka, which I believe is just outside the city of Nagano. And as she says on her website, her first career love is the entertainment industry, but she also handles materials in marketing, law, education, and other fields. Recently, she's been working with overseas film crews when they come to interview athletes in Japan. Raised in Chicago, Brenda majored in Japanese at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and moved to Osaka on the JET program in 1997. After teaching English for a number of years, she got a job as a production coordinator at Universal Studios Japan, and that is when her passion for interpreting and translating really started to bloom. In 2008, she completed a conference interpreting course and soon after moved to Nagano with her husband to start a family. She's now been translating for over 20 years and freelancing for nearly 12 years. Last year, she, her husband, and their four children, including twins, moved to a custom-built home in Suzaka. Brenda, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yes. So, since all three of our panelists tonight live in Nagano, I would like to start out by asking in a little more detail what brought you there and what you like about it. Okay, um, well, I never ever planned on moving to Nagano. Um, in fact, that was the last place I ever wanted to live probably. Um, I was born and raised in Chicago and I'm a city girl through and through. Um, I studied, well, I, in high school I had the chance to uh, do a homestay in Osaka and I loved it and I then went back to study uh, at Kansai Gaidai University and made lots of friends and went on drinking and had a great time um, and I was lucky enough on the JET program to get placed in Osaka so there was all my friends were already there, lots more drinking, lots more fun. Um, and then I got a job at Universal Studios, which was also uh, wonderful and fun and rewarding. Um, and then I met my husband and uh, he lived in Nagano and he's the chonan of a family. He does, he works for his father's business. So he's next in line to take over the business. And it's not just any business it's a traditional they're traditional craftsmen so um, it wasn't like he could just find someone else to take over the business or they could sell it um, he has been groomed basically to take over the business from the time he was born um, and at first he you know he was he's very uh, I guess modern thinking and said you know you don't have to move to Nagano you can stay in Osaka and I'll continue visiting you on weekends and stuff um, and so that's how we our married life began uh, we got married. I was still living in Osaka and working, and he was living in Nagano. And uh, and then I got pregnant, and I thought, I don't want to raise a child by myself um, or, you know, with just a weekend father. So, um, and also when we decided to get married, that was when I decided to do the conference interpreting course um, because I thought that would increase my chances for getting freelance work if I did move to Nagano. Um, so I felt like I was more prepared to live uh, in the Inaka um, with that under my belt. Um, and uh, Suzaka is, is a more rural town, I guess, than Nagano-shi is, although Nagano-shi is quite rural, but it is connected to Tokyo by the Shinkansen. So um, yeah, we lived near Nagano Station, which also made it easier to get work in Tokyo. Um, so uh, when I, so yeah, in 2008, 
eight months, 10 months pregnant, no, eight months pregnant, I moved to Nagano. Um, and uh, yeah, two months later, I gave birth to our daughter. Um, and it was the first year was very, very lonely and very hard. I'd always been, been very career oriented and work driven and raising a child in a place that I didn't know um, was very hard. But now I love it. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you. Has it grown on you? Do you feel like it's your place now? Um, feel comfortable and settled there? Yes. Um, and it, it took a while. I think, um, you know, my husband recommended that we live in Nagano City first. He thought it would be easier on me than moving straight to Inaka. Um, and he was right. I think it gave me a chance to establish myself um, and kind of figure things out what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. Um, and yeah, no, I, I can't imagine raising kids in Osaka. I think that would be much harder. Um, the fact that I can just kind of let them, I feel like I'm like letting the sheep out when I, <laughs> like when I let the kids go play and yeah, I don't really have to worry about where they are, or, you know? Yeah. Whereas in, if we were living in Osaka, I don't even know where I would let them go play on their own. So. Right. Um, Okay, so getting to your career, um, which a lot of your career, I guess, has focused on music, film, TV, other aspects of the entertainment industry. Um, and for me, at least, that industry has a kind of mysterious aura, and it's appealing on the one hand and also a little bit intimidating at the same time. So I'm curious how you broke into the entertainment industry as a transit. Well, um, obviously working at USJ, um, was a very big help. Um, you know, like having that on my resume, people just automatically feel comfortable giving me entertainment work. Um, and of course the connections that I made at USJ, um, working with a lot of, uh, producers and directors and choreographers, um, at USJ gave me uh, a lot of connections, um, to those types of jobs and people who came to USJ, um, you know, from the States, usually from the States or uh, UK to work would then recommend me to people that they knew who needed, you know, who were coming to Japan for whatever reason. Um, so that, I think that really helped. Um, and then just, I found working in Japan, you know, anytime I've been, even when I was looking for a job before I started working at USJ, I just told everyone and anyone I knew that I was looking for a job. I was ready to be done with English teaching and I wanted to use my Japanese at work. And I just told everyone, you know, I need a job. Does anyone, and basically, it, you know, someone I knew who was, uh, who had been on the JET program with me was doing this production coordinator job at USJ and she was going, she was getting ready to move back to Canada. And so she recommended me for the job. Um, and I got it. And, uh, so when I was looking for other entertainment work, I just kind of told everyone and anyone that I wanted to work in the entertainment industry and, you know, one person knows another and mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So a lot of word of mouth, it sounds like, and, and yeah. personal connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you maybe tell us about a couple of the more exciting or interesting projects you've been able to work on in, in that entertainment field? Um, so there is, uh, this is also just completely by chance. Um, I know a woman who was the marketing director, marketing, she was in marketing at uh, ASICS, the sneaker company in Kobe. And uh, they were creating uh, a documentary um, called Beyond Champions. I think that's what it's called. Um, and they needed an interpreter uh, to interview some athletes uh, in Tokyo. Swedish, she's Swedish, so the film crew that she brought over is Swedish, and, um, but, you know, they speak, flu you know, better English than native speakers. Uh, and they needed a film crew in Tokyo, to, or they needed an interpreter for their film crew in Tokyo, and so um, I helped them interview, first I helped them interview Damu Tokashiki, Tokashiki Yama. She is a, she plays for the WNBA in the US and she also plays professional basketball in Japan. And she's also, well, this would have been her second time in the Olympics, I think. Um, 
And so I got to uh, be with her, you know, for, for two whole days and the entire team that she, she plays on, um, as well as the, the Swedish, be with the Swedish crew as well, which was lots of fun. Um, and then when they came back again to do another episode, um, they uh, interviewed uh, Kiryu Senshu, who is one of the relay runners for the, the hundred, or he, the, he's also a hundred meter uh, sprinter uh in the olympics and he was the first japanese athlete to break the 10 second barrier uh for 100 meters um and then on a completely different uh with a completely different uh team uh they went back again to interview kidu senshu um so that was kind of exciting and the fact that he remembered me and stuff was was nice um and then uh i've also done a lot of interpreting for um summer sonic the uh music festival uh, that's held in Osaka and Tokyo. And so I've worked with a lot of big name bands. Um, and yeah, they're, it's, it's fun, but it's exhausting work. And they are um, usually quite a pain to take care of for two days, four days, yes. Is it like our typical image of prima donna music stars or does it, are there problems related to, you know, them swearing all the time or what, what is that like? Uh, usually the band members themselves are wonderful, wonderful, cooperative people. I think that they're quite aware of the fact that they wouldn't be where they are with all the people surrounding them. It's the people who surround them that are the pain to work with. Lots of times the managers, the tour managers, they don't understand that we're on the same page. They feel like they have to fight for everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to kind of, I've had to be like, you know, I want the same thing. I just want them on the bus on time. I'm not asking for, you know, so yeah. Yeah, it's usually the tour managers who are pains to deal with. <laughs> well, it sounds like your work as an interpreter goes a little bit beyond interpreting maybe. Um, <laughs> and that was also the next question I wanted to ask you, which was um, what are some of the skills that have helped you succeed um, specifically as an entertainment translator? An interpreter. Um, I think being familiar with you know the Japanese culture is is really important. Obviously, I think that a lot of times um, the musicians and the artists and the the film crews, especially the film crews, when they come, they're looking for someone to be kind of a cultural coordinator for them or a cultural liaison because uh, if you know when they're in the hotel and trying to get something done. It's very difficult, I think, a lot of times for foreigners who have no knowledge of Japan to just come over and get what they want done, especially since, um, you know, as we all know, people in Japan are not that fluent in English or not as much as you would expect them to be, uh, even in Tokyo. And so um, me having the cultural knowledge to be able to guide them uh, to get the things that they need done done um, has is definitely something that they appreciate. And I think what keeps them coming back to ask me to work with them or recommending me to their friends or you know, other crews that they know um, is because I'm able to, to guide them uh, within the Japanese system, how to get those questions, the sticky questions answered, how to get the, the managers to be a little more uh, lenient with how we use their, uh, their celebrities and their, uh, the people in their care. Huh, so a little bit of diplomacy, maybe. As yes, well. <laughs> yes, that's a definitely a good word for it, yes. Yeah, um, so we don't have too much time left, but I wanted to touch on something you mentioned in our emails um, before, the, before this event. You had mentioned that you were the driving financial force behind building a new house for your family. Um, so as the primary breadwinner for a family of six, you made up your mind to grow your freelance business to the point where you could get a loan for the house under your own name. And yep. you did that. And I wanted to know how you went about achieving that growth. Um, so again, it was just uh, telling everyone and anyone I knew that I was looking for work um, and not underselling myself. I think it's very, I was just talking to Louise about this yesterday. Um, having imposter syndrome, I suffer from that quite a bit, but uh, sometimes, you know, I tell myself, you just got to fake it until you make it. And so not underselling myself, but at the same time, letting myself or letting people know that I'm available and I want to work. 
Um, so I have basically, uh, the twins were born seven years ago and I went back, I decided I wanted to, well, we needed a house. Um, and I decided that I was ready to go back to work full time, put the twins in daycare uh, when they were about a year old. And that was when um, I do a, an interpreting job every year at Fuji Speedway. And there are a whole bunch of other interpreters and translators there. And I told all of them that I wanted to go back full time. And if they knew anyone who was looking for translators to please contact me. Um, and one of them hooked me up with a, someone who's become um, a great friend and also um, a great source of income. <laughs> Um, and she's an agent and we work, um, now we work together almost exclusively, but, uh, yeah, I just kind of put myself out there and told everyone that I was looking for work and yeah. Yeah. So how does it feel to be sitting in your house now? Um, was it basically, was it worth it all the work oh, to get there? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, if you well, just if you'd seen our old house, uh, yeah, I don't know where I would have sat to do this interview in the old house because it was basically falling apart around us. Um, and uh, yeah, I just this like this is a dream come true totally. So um, there's not one day that I regret putting my name exclusively on the ridiculously large loan that I took out to build this house. <laughs> great, great. Um, well, I think we're just about out of time with Brenda, unless you wanted to add any last comments. Um, you will, of course, have more time in the Q&A period, um, but did you want to say anything before we moved on? Uh, no, I'm just very uh, honored that to be here, and um, I, yeah, I've always been kind of afraid of sweat, but um, I, feel, <laughs> I feel less afraid now. And yeah, so I'm very happy to be here. So thank you very much for having me today. Great. Well, thank you, Brenda.